Okay, so yeah, so I'm Neil Klingensmith. I'm the first guy on this thing here. Uh, this is co uh, this is work with my co-authors, Young Hyun Kim and Suman Banerjee, both professors uh, at University of Wisconsin. So this is going to be about privacy techniques for mobile devices. Um, I think this is a really interesting area of research uh, right now, especially because you know in the popular media this stuff has become really interesting uh, to you know just j just like the general public lately. I put up some. Uh, headlines here from New York Times over the last year or so. I'll let you read these by yourself. But basically, you know, when, you, when, when I think about when I think about privacy, you know, I think about like mobile systems are really on the front line of this battle that we're having for privacy right now. And the reason for that is that these kinds of systems are, you know, they're they're collecting information about us that we really can't curate or filter. Okay. So if you go on to Facebook and you you know you you make a post on Facebook or something like that, you're sort of subconsciously filtering the information that you're giving to Facebook. Um, like, unless you're, unless you're Donald Trump, maybe, uh, who probably doesn't have as much of a filter as most of the rest of us. But the thing is, like these mobile devices, if you stick your phone in your pocket and you just drive around, maybe you go to work, you take your kids to school, whatever, right? These devices are collecting information about you all the time that you can't, you can't curate that information, right? And so what we want to do is we want to give users some kind of an ability to sort of like modulate the amount of information these devices uh, collect about you, and we want to try and come up with some kind of a technical solution for this, right? So basically, on one side of this knob, you're going to get a little bit more privacy out of your out of your mobile device by pruning information from the from the data streams that they collect about you, right? With the understanding that as you reduce the information content of the data streams, you might get a lower functionality out of your apps, right? And so we have something like this right now on our devices. It's the settings panel on our iPhone or whatever. Um, but the, the shortcomings here are that you know it's kind of a set and forget on off type of a type of a switch, right? So if I turn the microphone off for this app, it's going to be off until I turn it back on, right? And so there's really no like context sensitivity here. So if I you know for, I might want to have the microphone on in certain scenarios like when I'm, when I'm at home, but when I go out in public, maybe I don't want to have it on, right? And there's really no way to do that here. Right? And the other thing is, on, on, this, on, this kind of a, on this kind of a settings panel, we don't have the ability to like selectively redact information from the data streams. Right? So, so I might want to have the microphone on most of the time for this app, but if I say my social security number out loud, maybe I want that to be redacted. Right? And there's, no, there's definitely no way to do that here. Okay? So, so, so that's kind of the, uh, that, when I say we want to introduce this knob to turn for the users, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so let's look at the way that data flows just real quickly uh, through one of these apps. So, so, so if I put my phone in my pocket and like I'm driving around, and, and let's say I have an accelerometer on there, right? The accelerometer is going to uh, produce acceleration data a few times a second. It's going to send it to the OS, right? The OS is going to have a driver that picks it up and exposes it to the app via an API. And the app is going to take that information and send it through, you know, through the internet basically to the backend cloud services, right? And by the time that the information that this app is collecting about me gets to its cloud service provider is totally out of my control. And so what we want to do is we want to find some choke points in this chain where we can grab that information and then anonymize it. Okay, so there's anonymization algorithms out there already that can anonymize the data if I can get it, right? But the problem in mobile systems is that we can't always get that data because we don't have cooperation from the service provider and we don't have cooperation from the person who makes our phone, right? Google doesn't want to help us to do this, right? So what are the technical ways that we can get hold of that data in order to anonymize it, right? So there's kind of two choke points in this chain. Right? The first one is inside the OS, right? So we can maybe modify the driver in some way uh, to anonymize the data before it hands it off to the API, right? And the second choke point uh, might be somewhere in the, you know, in the network, in a middle box between, you can imagine like an edge, edge device between your phone, oh no. Uh, well, I'll go over here. Uh, between your phone and the, uh, you know, and the service provider, right? And so, so, so this, this second solution here has been studied fairly extensively, the network solution, right? Uh, the, the trouble with that, it's, it's a lot easier to deploy than the OS level techniques, right? But the, the trouble is by the time our data gets to the network, it's probably encrypted. And so in order to look at the information that's being shared about us, we would have to have some way of decrypting that information. And to do that, we have to have uh, cooperation from the cloud, from the from the service provider, right? And we assume that we don't have that. So, so for deployability's sake, we need to have some way of of uh, of not having cooperation from the service provider here. So, what I'm going to be talking about is OS level techniques that can grab the data uh, as it goes in transit, basically from our sensor to the OS. Okay? Because at, at, at that level, it's still unencrypted, right? 
So in order to tell you about this, I'm going to take you back to the 90s. Uh, when we used to write uh, like malware for these kinds of devices. This was when I was a little kid, so I never actually did this, but I used them sometimes. Uh, and there's this technique called interrupt hooking that was used to kind of like uh, write keystroke loggers and stuff like that back in like Windows 3.1, right? So let me just tell you about how, a, how an interrupt hook works, okay? So normally what happens is whenever I, whenever I have a, an I.O. event, uh, in my computer, okay, this goes for PCs, phones, whatever, right? I have, this, I have this table called the interrupt vector table, which stores a list of function pointers that, uh, and, and each function pointer kind of handles a specific I.O. event, okay? So one of those function pointers is for the USB controller, right? So if I push a key on my keyboard, that the, there's a scan code that goes through the USB, and then, it, and then it invokes this interrupt service routine here, and the operating system is gonna call this handler and handle the, handle the event, right? So what I'm gonna do here, uh, to, 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 in the interrupt hook situation, right, is I'm going to write this second function that the OS doesn't know about. It's called a hook, okay? And then I'm going to go into the vector table and I'm going to redirect the, the operating system's vector table to point to my hook first. And then, whenever I get a USB event, I'm going to have, I'm going to have the opportunity to inspect that USB event first, right? So I can, I can log the keystroke or maybe I can modify the scan code or whatever I want to do. And then at the end of the hook, then I can call the OS handler, and the OS handler has no idea that the hook ran ahead of it, right? So, so all the OS handler knows is I got some kind of a scan code, right? And then it deals with it. So this is, so this is the most basic implementation of a hypervisor, right? So this is how we do um, IO virtualization in hypervisors. And what, you, what we can think about here is that basically we're, we're putting this hook function in between the hardware and the operating system, right? And that, that's exactly what I was talking about before. We want to find some way of, like, intercepting that data before it just gets handed off to the OS, because by that point, then, you know, it's kind of out of our control, okay? So this is what we're gonna do. And uh, so what we did is we developed this, uh, this piece of software called Hermes, which is a hypervisor that runs on microcontrollers. And basically all it is is it's a, I don't wanna like minimize it too much, right? But, but at, at its core, it's just a collection of these interrupt hooks, okay? And so what, what we're gonna do is every time we get some kind of an IO event from one of our, one, one of our devices, we're gonna intercept that IO event and we're gonna process it with this privacy agent, okay? And the privacy agent is gonna contain some of these anonymization algorithms that, that have kind of been independently developed for different types of, um, different modalities of sensor information. Okay, so let me just talk really quickly here. I have four minutes left, so I'm gonna talk really quickly about how, the, how this hypervisor privacy agent works, okay? And then we, you can, maybe we can talk about this offline um, if there's any like, substantial questions. So there's two blocks in the, in the privacy agent, right? And this is, all, this is all kind of work in progress right now, so, so, um, so, so we're still kind of experimenting with these techniques. So there's two blocks, right? The first block is what we're calling the mode decision engine, right? And the, what the mode decision engine is gonna do is it's gonna look at an IO transaction that we got with this interrupt hook. And it's gonna ask itself, is this IO transaction compliant with the user's privacy policy, right? So if it's a video frame, does this IO transaction, does this video frame contain some kind of information that the user maybe doesn't wanna share with the cloud service provider, okay? So, so we're gonna input that video frame, which is the, the sensor data that we want to anonymize, right? We're not just going to input that video frame. We're going to also look at all the other sensor data that we have available to us, right? The GPS, the microphone, the accelerometer. And we're going to, and we're, and we're going to, this disk thing here is supposed to sort of like represent the uh, user's privacy policy that, that they programmed into the system, right? And so we're going to kind of look at all this information and there's going to be a decision tree implemented in this mode decision engine, which is going to decide what should we do with this frame, right? Is it compliant? If it's compliant with the privacy policy, then we're just going to pass it through, no problem, right? And the operating system can have the raw data. If it's not compliant, then we're going to try and anonymize the data first in order to make it compliant, right? And if we can't do that, then we're just going to drop it all together, okay? And then we're going to take the, the action that we've decided on with the mode decision engine and the data itself, and we're going to pass it to this anonymization module, which is then going to try and anonymize the data if necessary, okay? So maybe we might blur out some faces in a video frame or something, right? Okay, and you can also imagine that maybe different people have different requirements for what kind of anonymization they might want to do. Right, so you can imagine there might be some kind of an app store that you go, you go on and, and sort of like download different anonymization modules for, you know, for, for different purposes. Okay, so in order to test these techniques out, um, to see if we can actually run all of this software on a mobile device sort of in real time, right, we developed this mobile device demo platform, 
which is kind of this ugly looking board thing here. Um, but basically, it has all the features that you might find on a mobile platform. Okay? It has a camera, it has a screen, all this different stuff. And we wrote some apps for it. And one app I'll share with you is this camera app, which kind of does what you might expect. right? You just point the camera at something, and it shows the image on the screen. But what we're going to do is we're going to try and anonymize that camera data first and see what the computational overhead of doing that is. Okay? So here's the, here's the chain of events that's going to happen. So first, we're going to have a video frame coming in from the camera. Video frame is going to get processed by this ISR. This is the hook I was talking about before. The ISR is going to hand it off to a privacy agent. And then the privacy agent is going to anonymize it and hand the anonymized data off to the app. Okay? So the question here is, we, we added this extra block in here. And this is kind of like a computationally intensive block, right? Because we're trying to do video analytics in real time, right? So can we do that on a mobile platform, right? So, you know, or, or do we have to offload that task to some other, uh, you know, some, some edge device or something in the cloud or something like that, right? So what, what we're going to do, so we, we ran this test to see, you know, to see what the performance of that privacy agent is, uh, and in particular, what, what, is, what effect does that have on perceptual video quality in real time, right? So I'll put up some bar, bar plots here and try to explain them really quickly. Uh, so what, what you're seeing here is you're seeing the, the um, Interframe jitter, histograms of the interframe jitter uh, for different implementations of this privacy agent. Okay, so on the left side, we implemented the privacy agent in an RTOS environment, real time operating system. And on the right side, we implemented the privacy agent in the hypervisor, the Hermes hypervisor environment. Okay, and for each one, in for each environment, we have sort of like low IO load going on and higher IO load going on. Okay. And so what you can see is that in the RTOS environment, we have a little bit more interframe jitter, which causes re reduced perceptual video quality. OK. And then those are the, those are the actual interframe jitter. So, so I think the biggest open question right now is, oops, sorry. I think the biggest open question right now for, for this kind of work is deployability, right? So for this to be, for this to like actually make sense to, to use in the wild, we have to be able to deploy it. Right? And so how can you actually load Hermes onto your real mobile device? Right? That could be a real problem because we don't, have, we don't usually have access to the bootloader. Right? In order for, to have access to the bootloader, uh, excuse me, in order to load Hermes on the mobile device, we have to have either access to some kind of way of programming the bootloader or we have to, you know, we, we have to basically have some kind of low-level hardware access here, right? And so this is a real problem. So, so going forward, we're going to try and figure out, you know, are there some ways that we can do this that will allow us, to, you know, to, to basically implement these same kinds of features, right, without having this really super low-level um, hardware access to, to our devices, okay? Okay, so that is all for me, and I will take questions. <laughs>